Elton John, Tom Petty, Mick Jagger, Hans Zimmer. Oh, and those guys from South Park. I know the drummer who's played with all of those people and more. Kurt Biscara is a living legend, and I'm lucky enough to call this dude, this drummer, my friend. It's crazy. So I gave him a call and I had him sit down and today we talked about just about anything you can imagine. How to be a better session drummer. The pros and cons to using electronic drums versus acoustic drums in the recording studio. How AI now plays into all of this and how you can continue to change and evolve in your own ways as a musician as you navigate building a life in music. So with no further ado, check out this conversation I had with Kurt Biscara. Here we are. I got Kirky B, Kurt Biscara on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me, my friend. Oh, man, absolutely. What, a, what an honor and pleasure to be with the, the host with the most. <laughs> As we all know and love you on your post. Your, your, uh, wow, that just rhymed. Dude, I, it's, it's really crazy because, you know, a lot of the music that I grew up with, you played on whether it was my mom's favorite music or my dad's favorite music and then what, what am i old <laughs> and then i kid i kid it's crazy because then you know instagram does come along and you and i connected on there a few years back and then we get to phone conversations and working together on projects and stuff and it's i'll tell you i'm just so um i always have to pinch myself because it's just crazy how heroes idols legends have become acquaintances and friends now. And I I just hope you know how much I appreciate this friendship. And oh, I'm man. looking forward to talking about everything you've done with your life and what younger musicians can take from that. Likewise. I likewise and I'm I'm here to here to serve. Well let's let's get serving. We're gonna serve up the tea. So so you've worked with Johnny Rotten from the Sex Pistols, Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones, Elton John, Tom Petty, Hans Zimmer, even the boys from South Park. So you know, having all these experiences over your career, what do you think you can give to musicians on how they might approach, you know, any session right? And how might musicians ensure that they're always serving any artist, no matter what's being thrown at them? Well, I always tell, uh, you know, whenever I do master classes or if anyone asks me this question, I think the most important thing first is people skills. Because when you're walking into a session, you're not only walking into, let's say, someone else's home studio or a hired studio in Hollywood, Nashville, New York, wherever, but you're walking into a room filled with people. And there's a bunch of people there that play a bunch of different instruments, maybe some that don't, but they're there that are holding the pen and the check, waiting to write it to you. So it's really, you walk in with, with good people skills. And I'm not saying kiss ass or anything like that. Just be yourself and be open to the situation because it could be intense. It could be tense. It could be really laid back. It could be, you just have to read the room, as they say. You read the room, and the reason why you got called in the first place is because they want you to play drums. That That's really the essential aspect of it is that they called you to play drums you're the guy. There's no one else waiting in the hallway. It's your drums that are already set up there or you're bringing them in. So you you got the gig. So leave that alone. You don't have to stress on that. Now you just concentrate on just being a really open human being and listening with your ears and with your heart and provide uh, whatever it is that the artist or the producer or both provide what they're looking for. Because that's why it's called a recording session, and you're a, a session musician. You're there to provide what it is that they need. I mean, to me, it almost sounds like my nine to five work as a copywriter. Because what I'm doing is I'm taking what a client wants in the words on whatever document we're working on, and I have to think about what that client wants, but also what the audience wants. And I'm trying to balance all of these things and keep all of these stakeholders happy. But it's right. you know those soft skills. I think are important in any job, but where do you think, you know, how do you think you developed them over the years? And how do you think that's changed over the many, many years you've been playing? Well, I think the more and more you do it, the more comfortable it becomes uh, to answer that first part of the question. The second part, um, I think where it's going, it really is, uh, I mean, for me, I, I will say it's been recording from home by myself. 
the majority of my work. So we're um, we're in that age now where that we're using um, technology to get creative stuff done. Uh, the pandemic really helped that along. But I think now at this point, you just have to embrace it and get comfortable with being your own engineer, uh, learning whatever DAW you want to learn on and record, edit, mix, um, you know, be your own producer. Your own everything. <laughs> yeah, your own everything. Yeah. And there's a bunch of hats you got to put on all the time and you, you just can't let it stress you out. And um, my, my motto is just go slow one thing at a time, you know. That's how I did it, and I'm able to, you know, compete with the best of them in terms of sending off, you know, world-class files, uh, drum files to anyone. You know, Sammy Hagar, uh, up in Nashville, New York, uh, France, Italy, South America, it, you know, just anywhere and everywhere. So, Well, and it's interesting that you bring up the home recording thing, too, because now you were a guy who had many, many drums, acoustic drums. But you always had mm -hmm. the old uh, drum cat, yeah. kind of the OG electronic yep. drums. And now I finally saw you're, you're getting rid of that and upgrading. But as far as that's concerned, where do you see for remote studio musicians, where's the advantage, pros and cons of going with something like an electronic drum set and then using sort of plugins like Superior Drummer or that sort of thing? Well, I think there's, there's a, uh, an advantage of knowing both. Because you will get those people that are just purists and they want an old 70s Olive Badge Ludwig. And then you have to know how to mic it to get that 1970s Olive Badge Ludwig sound. Then there are people that need it right away. Man, I need you, Tim, to play drums on this thing. Do you have Superior Drummer? Yes, I do. Okay. Pound out three or four takes. Send me the MIDI files. I'll take care of the sounds here on my end. So now you're providing digital information. MIDI and or audio and you just have to be proficient at both and uh, because now time is money you know a lot of budgets operate on shoestrings these days so you have to be flexible you know the thing about today is it is it's so different than I mean dude one of your first big gigs to starting out was more stay in the time from that sort of it's. Prince camp which is amazing there was something so touching that you told me recently and you said that you know, you wish that when you were a kid, you would have started out building a career in the way that I'm building my own today. So, like, what do you mean by that and why? Like, what value do you see in what I'm doing now? Well, I think it reaches much more people in terms of not only your playing ability and your higher ability as a drummer, but it also gives the um, perception, which you can back up, of being able to wear a bunch of hats, you know, just what we were saying three three to five minutes ago, being able to wear a bunch of hats. And, uh, you know, I will admit, when I got that gig in the 80s with Morris, we didn't have the internet. You know, we didn't even have cell phones. So it was all about, okay, I got to make a call, but I got to find a pay phone. I got to pull over and make a phone call. And usually that phone call was, hey, I'm going to be an hour late. Okay. So things ran slower then, but now with the digital age, with the internet, with iPhones, with these multiple ways of communicating, things must happen in a, in in an instant. I wish I wish back then I was able to uh, foresee like okay I could put myself in a uh, in a way where people can reach me uh, more adequately rather than leaving a voicemail on my tape machine, you know, voice uh, answering thing, you know. Um, so, I mean, but I worked with what I had and it and it, it was fine. But I, I think I think you did kind of pioneer some of that way of being through like the original drum DVDs you did. There was like there were a few uh, VHS and DVD tapes of drummers. There was like yours and like brain his old tapes. Do you remember that, dude? It was like a skateboard yeah. video style tape that came out and it's like the the stuff that you two did in particular was so different than like a weckle tape or that sort of thing and do you think why would you why did you approach it like that back then was it because of these sort of same sort of tenets or like you know like the just the way you are as a person it was just like i'm gonna do my own thing and what was what was the approach there well i just always found 
the typical drum video is so boring. It's like rudiments, paradiddles. <laughs> it's like, fuck. <laughs> it's like, dude, I, dude, I don't want to. I, I mean, I, we have enough of that already, right? With books and teachers and stuff. And it was like, you know, growing up in California, I grew up around a lot of surfers and skateboarders and was a skateboarder myself. And it was like, there's a spontaneity in skating. And I wanted to bring that to drumming, you know, which is why I listen to punk rock. It's why I listen to hardcore funk and R&B and soul, which is why I listen to heavy metal, which is why I listen to jazz and bebop and um, fusion, because at, an, at a moment's notice, that's what I want to hear. And even classical music, um, you know, Balinese, uh, you know, my native land of the Filipino tinikling dance, you know, just just anything because everything is inspiring. And I just felt like those videos just they had the element of, OK, I'm sitting here with you one on one as a teacher. But, dude, what are you really about? What do you mm -hmm. do? You like pizza? <laughs> do you like do you like Barbecue? I what what do you like? Who are you? You know? What makes you such a badass drummer? Uh it's gotta be something. Do you like eating hoagies? Is that inspirational? You know, food and drumming, man. I'm sorry. I, I, I know I'm using food reference, but what else is there, right? But it's it's real though. I mean think about all the touring guys now. There's a there's an Instagram account uh partially run by a, a dude I know Mike Robinson called Food on Tour and it's literally just about musicians and what they're eating on tour because it's almost like the music and food are such universal things that we almost need in life. I mean, could you go without music? I guess, yeah, but it'd be a pretty boring life. You couldn't necessarily go without food, but because these things I think both are so integral to life, it's uh there are some similarities there and especially with getting creative with either of those arts. Yeah, I mean it goes back to God Neanderthal times of pounding on a log, you know, it, it either meant war or eat or both. <laughs> Maybe. Eat first, then kill or kill first, then eat. I don't know. But so we've gone now back to the time of the Neanderthals. Now let's go move forward to the time of the aliens. So like in the future. <laughs> I mean, oh, dude, AI is we're done. <laughs> we're done. We're done. The beautiful thing, though, about AI now, as far as the legality is concerned, is that you can't copyright. There's no sort of intellectual protection for anything created by AI. It's the Wild West. But, but you know, having that protection now as uh, human musicians, I think, is, is, is key. And so, like, I mean, where do you see you've seen everything change time and time again. You got in at, at sort of the last hoorah of rock and roll and then you moved into the first generation of the digital age napster uh hard disc re you went you went from tape to adat to hard disc to to now daw recording literally every iteration of these things where the heck does it go from here like do you do you see into the future at all or have any ideas of where this stuff is going to go especially for drummers because our instruments like a century old plus the set well i was i was i was hosed when i got in the game in 1984 when i moved down to la the drum machine already existed so there were drum machine tracks that were on the record uh, on the radio already so i was already working against the deficit you know so i think where it's going to go or where i personally like to push it to go is that we are drummers we are now recording in a daw Pro Tools, Logic, Studio One, you name it, Ableton, whatever. We record to a grid. What's the one thing that will separate us all? Recording without a grid. It rushes, it slows down, it rushes. And I push this upon my clients. Let me do a take, just one. I know you're going to put me to the grid, but let me do one as a human. And... 50-50, 50 percent of the time they go, we're going with the human take. It just feels better because I just think our hearing isn't made to hear zeros and ones. It's made to hear waveforms and our heartbeats and our and our and our blood, the way it circulates and the way we breathe. You know that exhilarating shortness of breath on a roller coaster, that 
exhilarating shortness of breath going into that first fill in the chorus. We all do it. It's it's a natural state of being. And if we could apply that to recording, oh my God, we we will then have a renaissance, if you will, of of recorded music again. And and we we will all sound like ourselves and we won't like I can't distinguish what drummer's playing on what these days. I don't know. Could be me, it could be you, could be anyone. I totally I agree with you there and that I think the humanity part of this is the most important thing of the music period. And the way that I originally garnered that skill, I think, is partly through I think improvisation is a big part of that. It's almost like uh, I think of it like comping, but in any context, it's not just about jazz, but it's about rock, ska, punk, whatever, whatever you want, right. wherever you want to take it. Right. And so that and understanding time and, and sort of the flow of time when you're playing with a group of musicians. I started that when I was a kid. I was playing in bands when I was 12, 13 years old. And I don't think as many young people have that opportunity today. We're all siloed in our own homes behind our computers and all of these things so how do we get back to a place do you think where uh younger musicians can start to learn these skills is it simply that we have to be together again or or what well i think i think that's a very important aspect is to get together again in a room because there's interaction when you go to a restaurant there's multiple chefs back there there's a sous chef the main chef the dishwashers, the the servers, that that's a band. They're making the music, which is here I go again with the food references. <laughs> I must be hungry. <clears throat> I'm always hungry. It, it it's it's one of those things where you have all those people in the kitchen and they're making this one thing. Same with musicians. You get them all in a room and they're gonna make something. Because of the internet and we're all siloed, like you said, great word. We're all siloed and we've learned how to project our talents outwardly, digitally, through a camera and through audio. But we're missing that one step of being together as humans and creating together. I, I know I know that the, the youngsters don't like to talk. They like to text. But in a situation where there's a band, you have to talk. You have to not look at your shoes and shoe gaze while you're playing. You have to engage human to human and look at the surroundings on stage and, and, and vibe with yourself and with the others on the stage. And then, of course, the audience. And I think that there's no feeling like it once you do that, you know? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I haven't gigged now in, since 2016, so it's been a long time. But I miss that because it, it I, isn't just about the band. Like you say, it is then it is about the audience. You're there to serve the audience the same way you were serving the band and serving the song. It's uh, it's like, it's like that movie title, was it? Uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once or something like that, you know? Yeah, I don't know where we go from here then as far as uh, an industry, but I, I am hopeful. I will say that much, that I, I am hopeful. The humans aren't going to stop making music. It's just how can we monetize it? How can we control it? How do we make it so it's fun again and an experience again? You know, I mean, I, I was looking at ticket prices for general seating for concerts. Oh, my God. By the time you pay the this fee and the that fee and the parking fee and the hot dog fee and the this fee and the that fee, dude, you're you're in. If, if you're going with yourself and somebody else, two people, it's, dude, it's, listen, it, you're spending minimum five hundred dollars if you want to enjoy yourself. Who has five hundred bucks to blow on a concert on one night? Yeah. So what does everyone do? Eh, I'll go to YouTube. Someone someone taped it. You know. So I I, I really don't know where it's going to go. I think um, I think it'll be important though to continue to play live. I, I was talking to a actor friend of mine. And we were talking about, you know, the whole writer's strike and all that stuff. And I was like, don't you think there'll be a renaissance of like acting again on stage live, like live theater, live plays? And he's like, yeah, I think so. You know, because, you know, if they don't come up with a deal, I, it looks like they do have one maybe. But if they don't, I hope that would come back again. I mean, how cool would that be to see, uh, I don't know, some show outside under the stars, you know, where you can 
see actual actors act like musicians go to the park and see musicians play music. I like that. I think that's uh that's a good vision to have for the future. But what about you? Like again, uh, time and time again, you're riding every wave that comes at you going from the live drummer to the working in the big studio drummer to the working in your house drummer. So where do you take your career next? I'm not sure, but I know that, that I have to keep an open mind, an open heart and just keep going. And eventually it'll find its place. I'll find my place. Uh, Cause it's kind of wide open right now. You know, I see people such as yourself doing your podcast and I see podcasts. I see, instructional videos. I, I see a bunch of things and there's a lot of information. Do this to get this. You know, there's a lot of those kind of videos, but for what, what is the purpose to be by myself, to learn to play double pair diddles by myself? Maybe, but at some point you have to be able to take all this info that we're, we're taking into our brains from the internet and apply it somewhere. I think that's where it's going short term for me anyway, is that I have all this information, so I got to get it out there, you know, and that's really the only way I could best describe what it is I'm doing. You know, I still do sessions at home, from home for people. Uh, last week I did a session outside of my home, uh, first time in three years. And I got to say, I didn't miss it. And for me to say that, it, it means that we have moved on. We have marched on in time and things have changed. The first thing that made me not dig it, 25 minutes of trying to find a, a, a parking spot. I don't have to find a parking spot here in my house. <laughs> I just have to find my robe. Oh, here's my bathroom. Now I can play. That to me is more um, conducive to what needs to happen. You know, the sooner I could get the client my drum takes, they're better off and they could move forward because it's everything is moving faster now. Yeah, you can't move fast when you're trying to find parking. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's so real. I mean, like uh, oh, somebody I'm hoping to have on the pod here in the next few months is uh, uh, Eman Cervantes. I don't know if you know that dude. He's an L.A. guy. No, um, but cool name. Yeah, yeah. And um, he's doing the same thing as, as you were. He's doing uh, he still still does the live work, but. He's he's excelling in this whole home studio thing because of being able to be so nimble. So I think, uh, but at, at one point I did want to make those. It's not to say that the work outside of the home is is bad or invaluable to a musician. It's just that you personally are moving forward. You, you've done so much of that stuff. You've moved forward to something else that brings you joy right now. Yeah, yeah. And, and let me expound upon that, you know. When, when I said I didn't miss it, you know, I it was three years since my last session at another studio. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, I miss it so much. I miss it so much and all these things. And and, and I got to say, you know, I, you know, the drum sound, you know, I, my sound here is dialed and it and it's rivals any of the best rooms I've ever worked at because I worked hard at getting the drum sounds. Again, the parking. Ugh. Um yeah. Uh, there's just there's just something about comfort level now. You know, before when I was doing sessions all the time, you know, I, I would be doing a session every day at some studio and I'd need multiple drum kits. I would need three or four kits out at the same time. Capital, Westlake, Sunset Sound, you know, they'd just be rotating. I'd do a commercial in the morning, a movie date in the afternoon, two record dates in the, in the evening you know this was daily and um and that doesn't exist anymore that's gone that's done and i was there for it and uh you know i caught the last decade of it the the 90s i caught it and then i remember the year 2000 i'm at the apex i've said this many times but at the apex of the of the roller coaster looking down going oh my god year 2000 what's what's in store after 2000 you know Y2K is going to hit. The power is going to go off. And I'm looking down for the apex of the roller coaster only to look down and not see any tracks at the bottom for the roller coaster to roll down onto. And that's when I knew it's like, okay, 10 years went by and it's changed. 
2010, same thing. 2020, same thing. And here we are now, 2023, going into 2024. And we're all just kind of trying to find our niche, you know? I, th I But I think there's there's a good point there that it's, there's a few good points there. One of which is, again, continue to ride every wave you can, but also looking forward, don't be so afraid of the, you know, losing the tracks on the roller coaster because something's going to be built in front of you if you just keep moving forward. Fingers crossed. But, right. uh, I mean, look at here you are so many years later and you're still landing on your feet every time. So, Well, again, you know, you have to be flexible. You have to have an open mind, uh, open heart, and just go with it. You know, I mean, there's no freaking guarantee in this industry. You know, my mom was a musician and she forbade me to move to Los Angeles to go to music school. She's like, get a job, you know, go to college and get a job and learn computers. And I'll never forget when I got my first Macintosh 9600. It's like, see, mom, I got a computer and I'm making music. And she's <laughs> like, ah, you know, but but it it was really like, OK, I'm so invested in this. I have to be a drummer at all cost. If I'm homeless, it's 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 at all costs. And you you either enter that way or or forget it. You know, just go do something else. Because in order for you to make it in anything, not just being a drummer, but if you want to be like at the top of Wall Street, if you want to be the best plumber or electrician, you have to immerse yourself. Hang around plumbers and electricians, hang around drummers, hang you know, hang around, be in that element all the time because if that's what you decide you want to be, that's what you gotta be. Yeah. Yeah, I dig that. If uh, if young musicians, if the music doesn't work out, hopefully we've convinced a few today that they should be a plumber, if anything else. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> listen, not not that there's anything wrong with them being a plumber because, geez, I certainly don't know anything about that. But uh, they make but, more money than we do, I think. I know, I know, they do, <laughs> they do. And uh, you know, it just it's one of those things where it's like, for me, it seems that the drumming thing is like a hobby at this point. You know, like when you go to someone's house and you see a, a ship inside a bottle and it's like, you know, that's what they do in their spare time because it's a hobby. I'm going to build the Nina, the Pinta and the Santa Maria in a bottle, you know, and they're in there with tweezers and sticks and glue and magnifying glasses. And it's just like, that's where I feel like I'm at. You know, I had done all these amazing records and tours and stuff. It's like now it's kind of like it's hit the hobby level. So now it's like, okay, now I got to wear the different hats, be a podcaster, be a, give lessons, um, be a spokesperson, be an MC, um, come up with uh, products that help you grip your sticks, um, just different things that apply myself to the industry the best I can. If people want to find out more about uh, your, your teaching, your coaching, your products, your podcast, and uh, your barbecue, where are they going to find you at? First of all, you go to Instagram at Kurt Bisk, C U R T B I S Q, Instagram and X, uh, Twitter. That's also Kurt Bisk, C U R T B I S Q. For right now, go to greensations.com. A bunch of different products there you can get. I don't endorse it, but I will endorse it now. But this is amazing for like sinus stuff, which I'm having right now. And I've turned on so many touring musicians with Sinus Plumber. It's Incredible. Uh, go to greensations.com. And what it is, is it's a natural spray for your nose. Uh, it's it's the extract from hot chili peppers. And it clears your sinuses immediately. It's great. So like if you're on tour and you're in some funky locker room or whatever for the dressing room and there's mold, this stuff will knock it right out. You'll be able Put to breathe. Put the peppers up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like eating wasabi, you know, or getting pepper sprayed. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a little bit of both at the same time and then yeah, your website too uh kirkybmusic.com kirkybmusic.com all right well kirky b thank you so much for joining me today again truly appreciate it oh I dude hope, anytime uh, anytime I hope, I hope these kids appreciate all the knowledge we're trying to drop i hope so too and if you guys if you guys out there you have any questions email email me at kirkybdrum.com at gmail.com. If you have any questions, I I love to 
return emails. I get a lot of questions concerning what was it like to play with Elton John? What was it like to play with the Mick Jagger? How do you hold your sticks? What kind of soy sauce do you use on your rice? You know, things like that. I'm 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 down. Food, drums, and everything in between. Dude, you got it. it. I'm in. Count me in. Awesome. Sweet. All right. Well, until next time. Yeah, Tim. Thank you, man.